The following Stealing the Mind Bible Conference presentation is by Dave Reagan and is entitled Revelation Wrath, Revelation Glory. For a free catalog of all of our Bible study DVDs, CDs, audio tapes, and books, call Compass at 1-800-977-2177 or on the web at compass.org. I'm delighted to be here, and I was saying I can't tell you how delighted because my ministry is located in Dallas, Texas, and you may not be aware of this, but Dallas is suffering the worst uh, drought in 60 years, since 1950. Most of the lakes have dried up. We're in stage four of water rationing. The place is very critical. We've had 41 days of 100 degree temperatures, most of them 105. Uh, we um, uh, have had, uh, we're 35 inches below rainfall. When I arrived here yesterday afternoon, it was raining. I wanted to just go out and stand in it. I went up to my room and I was so cold I turned the heat on. <laughs> I called my wife and I said, honey, it's raining and I've turned the heat on and she hung up on me. She <laughs> wouldn't even, said, I don't, even, I don't even want to hear it. I just don't even want to hear it. People always find things to laugh about in bad times and I think that's good because it helps us to persevere. I got an email the other day from a friend in Texas who said, David, I've decided the Texas drought is so bad, I've done some research on it, and it's so bad that I've discovered that Baptists in Texas are now sprinkling. <laughs> the Methodists are using damp washcloths. <laughs> the Presbyterians are handing out rain checks. <laughs> and he says, you know, it's really critical when all your Catholic friends are praying that God will turn wine into water. So, put us on your prayer list and pray for rain. In fact, the Dallas Morning News announced this morning that this weekend most of the churches in Dallas are going to have special services to pray for rain. It's really the situation is that bad. Wrath and glory. The reason I entitled it that is because the book of Revelation teaches that at the second coming of Jesus, the initial thing that the world will experience is the overwhelming wrath of God. That Jesus is coming to pour out the wrath of God upon those who have rejected the grace, mercy, and love of God. And the presidents and the prime ministers and the kings will crawl into holes in the ground and cry for the rocks to fall upon them. So great will be the wrath of the Lamb of God. But it also teaches that it's going to end that period of time with Jesus being glorified before all the nations of the world. He will receive the glory that he did not receive the first coming. He will be king of kings and Lord of lords. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. So we're going to take a look now at wrath and glory. And I want to begin by commenting on this man you see on the screen here. This is a dear friend of mine over the years, Dr. Henry Morris, who was the founder of the Institute for Creation Research. And this is a picture that was taken of the two of us in his office shortly before he died just recently. I start with him because Dr. Morris wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation entitled The Revelation Record. And at the beginning of that commentary, he had a profound comment that I will never forget. And here was the comment. People complain that the book of Revelation is difficult to understand. They are wrong. It is not difficult to understand. It is difficult to believe. If you will believe it, you will understand it. The problem is most people spend their lifetime spiritualizing it to death. My rule of interpretation of the Bible from beginning to end, whether it's prophecy or not, is if the plain sense makes sense, don't look for other sense or you will end up with nonsense. Just take it for its plain sense meaning and do not spiritualize it. I think the reason people love to spiritualize so much is because when you start spiritualizing the Word of God, you become God because you can make the Word mean anything that you want it to mean. Now, I believe there is a satanic conspiracy. A satanic conspiracy to keep people from understanding the word, the, the uh, book of Revelation. I don't think Satan wants anybody to understand the book of Revelation. He doesn't want them to understand it because he doesn't want them to find out that he is going to be totally defeated and Jesus is going to be totally triumphant. And so therefore, most people look upon the book of Revelation as if it were some sort of, uh, of mysterious book clothed in darkness like a Chinese puzzle impossible to understand unless you have a vivid imagination or you have a PhD in hermeneutics or something of that nature. But but I'm here to tell you that anybody can understand the book of Revelation if they have the Holy Spirit residing inside of them, and that is a big if. 
You've got to have the Holy Spirit residing inside of you. You've got to rely on the Holy Spirit and you can understand. The turning point for me in my life came when one day I started to read the book of Revelation and I noticed a verse that had never noticed before. It jumped out on me and grabbed me by the throat and it shook me till my teeth rattled. And that was Revelation 1 verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and who heed the things that are written within it. Being a person who literally believes the word, I believe that verse. And I bowed my head right there and I said, Lord, you know I'm about to read this book and I want to claim this blessing in advance. The blessing I want to claim is I want to claim the blessing of understanding. Help me to understand this book. I've read it hundreds of times since then. Every time I pause at chapter 1 verse 3 and I pray for greater understanding, I do not claim to understand everything in the book of Revelation. But every time I read it, I come to a better understanding. And I want us to pause right now and pray that the Lord will give to every person here today that blessing because we're going to look at the whole book. Father, I come to you in the name of Yeshua, your son, our Messiah, and I pray, Lord, that you will bless as we go through this marvelous book of Revelation. May each of us here see things we've never seen before. May we understand things we never understood before. And most of all, may all of us be drawn into a deeper relationship with you and your blessed son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, the book of Revelation was written in about 95 A.D. It was written by uh, about 65 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was written by John, who was on the island of Patmos at the time. He was a Roman, uh, uh, a Roman uh, citizen, and as a result, he was a Roman prisoner, and I say, a prisoner at that time, because a great persecution under the emperor Domitian had broken out against the church. Patmos is an island that's located off the western coast of modern-day Turkey. It is located very near the, uh, the cities to which he addressed seven letters in this book. You can see them there on the map. The church was suffering at this time from terrible persecution, Christians being uh, crucified, Christians being fed to wild animals, and uh, John was the bishop of the church at Ephesus. You can imagine how j astonished John was when as he was contemplating one day, perhaps meditating upon the Word of God, Jesus Christ suddenly appeared to him. It had been 65 years since Jesus had been on this earth, and now he had returned to the Isle of Patmos. And John was so astonished that he fell at the feet of Jesus as if dead, because Jesus appeared in his glorified body. He appeared with all of his deity restored, the deity, uh, the, the, the aspects of deity that he had left behind, the glory of his being when he had taken on human flesh had all been restored. And here he was in his full glory. And John fell at his feet as though dead. And that caused Jesus to make a statement to him that is one of the most comforting statements in all the Word of God in Revelation 1 verses 17 and 18. Do not be afraid, John. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. What is he saying there? He's saying, John, I am the beginning of history. I am the end of history. I am the middle of history. I am the meaning of history. And I have overcome death, and because of that, I have the keys. I have authority over two things. I have authority over death and Hades. I have authority over the body, death. And I have authority over the spirit, Hades. And I control both, John, so do not be afraid. Jesus then began the book of Revelation by dictating seven letters to seven churches. Now, there are many more churches than that at the time he di dictated these letters. I believe he selected these seven because they were representative of every church that existed at that time and every church that has existed since that time and every church that exists today. He began by uh, uh, addressing a letter to the church at Ephesus where John was the bishop. Then it went to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and finally to the apathetic church of Laodicea. Now, I believe these churches represent seven different types of churches that still exist to this day. Let's take a look at them. First was the legalistic church. The church in Ephesus. This was the church that crossed the T's and dotted the I's and make sure all of the doctrines were correct and precise. And yet it had lost its love. Then there was the church at Smyrna, the persecuted church, severely persecuted, as many churches in the world today, like the church in China, are severely persecuted. Then there was the liberal church, the church at Pergamum. This was the church that was the opposite of the one in Ephesus. It did not care anything about doctrine. It was willing to accept into its fellowship anyone who came along. It was a touchy-feely church. Then there was the church at Thyatira, the pagan, 
the cultic church. This was the church that uh, was Christian in name only. And then came the church at Sardis, a church that had a reputation for being alive, but was in reality dead. And then came the glorious church, the church at Philadelphia. Isn't it amazing today that the only remains are what you see in that photograph there, and directly behind it is a, uh, a mosque. But that is the church at what's left of the church of Philadelphia. At that time, it was an alive church. It was a church with a great zeal for the Lord. It was a church that was so full of the Spirit that God gave it an open door to do evangelism. And finally came that pitiful church, the church at Laodicea, a worldly church, an apathetic church, a church that was enamored with its own importance, with its own wealth, with its own power. Now, in addition to representing seven different types of churches then and now, I believe these churches represent seven different types of professing Christians. I believe every person here who professes Jesus Christ can find yourself in one of these churches. Are you a legalistic Christian? Do you, uh, in order to shake hands with a brother in Christ, have to ask him 40 questions first and he has to give all the right answers and even then you're a little bit suspicious of him? I grew up in a church like that. Are you a persecuted church, uh, Christian? Perhaps you're not here in this country, but more and more we're finding churches being persecuted even in this country. Are you a liberal Christian? Are you a pagan Christian? Are you a dead Christian? Are you a zealous Christian? Are you an apathetic one? Well, of course, all of us would like to fall into that category of being zealous Christians on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ and members of churches that are just like that. Now, in addition to these churches representing seven churches that existed, types that existed then, And in addition to them representing seven different types of individual Christians, I believe these churches also represent seven periods of church history. And during, let me make an important point here. During these periods of church history, all seven existed. But one of the seven was predominant. Let me show you what I mean. We start breaking these into church periods. The church at Ephesus, the apostolic church, the legalistic church, the church concerned and focused upon doctrine, existed from about 30 to 100 when the great uh, persecution broke out by Domitian. Then we come to the martyr church from the mid-90s, around 100 to 312. The church was terribly persecuted, and Satan began to see that he was losing the battle because the more he persecuted church, the more the church spread and multiplied. And he had to come up with a new strategy, which we'll see in just a moment. Why 312? Because that was the year that Constantine, the emperor, accepted uh, Jesus Christ and became a Christian. And Christianity became the the religion of the empire. Many people think that's the greatest thing. You you see it ever happened in the history of Christianity, that the emperor became a Christian and and Christianity became the religion of the empire. But history shows us it was a terrible thing because what happened was that the moment that the emperor declared Christianity to be the religion of the empire, all of the pagan priests simply put on a cross and continued to do whatever they had been doing. All of the Babylonian occultic practices were brought over into Christianity. Anytime the church gets in bed with the state, the church is corrupted. And that's what happened in this situation. So the church moved into a period there of apostasy. And during that apostate period leading up to the establishment uh, of the uh, papacy and and the papacy uh, exercising control over all the church, we have this apostate period. Once the papacy was uh, thoroughly ingrained, then we move into the pagan period from about 590 until 1517 when the Reformation began. This is the darkest period in church history. This is where Satan is corrupting the church from within to the point that by the end of this period, the church was so corrupt, it was selling, actually selling salvation to the highest bidder. Then came the Reformation, and we got, got back to the Word of God, and there was a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit that blew through the church, and it looked like the church had come alive. It had a reputation for being alive, but it was dead. You know why? Because the Protestant reformers did exactly what the Catholic leaders had done. Each one of them formed alliances with governments in Europe, and they got in bed with the state. And as they got in bed with the state, their reformation practices were corrupted to some degree or another they were limited to one degree or another and as a result of that the reformation did not go as far as it could have because they were uh, controlled by the state they had a reputation of being alive but they were in effect dead then came the church at Philadelphia the church that really came alive this is the period from 1700 to 1900 when the church suddenly uh, stopped its navel gazing position and began to say hey we need to go out to the world and they began to send missionaries out all over the world and began to translate the Bible into many different languages and for almost 200 years the church was on fire and Satan was on the defensive but Satan never stays on the defensive very long we come to the 
final period, the apathetic period that began around 1900, depending upon the nation, in this country around 1920. And the cause of this was the German school of higher criticism, which hit this country like a bomb, which almost destroyed Christianity in Europe and England today to the point that in England today, only 7% of uh, people uh, claim to, to attend a Christian church. And on the continent of Europe, it's more around 2%. What happened? The German school of higher criticism said, hey, we got news for you. This is not the Word of God. This is man's search for God. And therefore, it's full of myth, legend, and superstition. And people began to stop preaching with any authority whatsoever. They offered no uh, solutions to the problems that people had. And the church began to wither on the vine. But praise God, the Holy Spirit began to move in Asia, Africa, America, Africa Latin America, and the church is on fire in those areas today. Satan always is attacking the church, the Holy Spirit, is always going back on the offensive. Here is the man, John Stott, great evangelical leader of Europe, uh, of England, who uh, to this day is the most outstanding evangelical voice in England. He has the best summary of these seven letters that I've ever run across. They're contained in his book about the New Testament. And here's how he summarizes these seven letters. Look at it. It's, it's brilliant. He says, to a sinful church, Jesus is saying, I know, Repent. And to a doubtful church, Jesus is saying, I have conquered, believe. And to a faithful church, Jesus is saying, I am coming soon, endure. What is the message of the seven letters of the seven churches? Repent, believe, endure. And I dare say that is the message of the Holy Spirit to the church today. Now, the suffering church of John's time desperately needed a second touch from Jesus Christ. And Jesus gave them that touch in these seven letters. The letters made the point that he was aware of their conditions. That even though he had gone to heaven, he was aware. He was not some distant God who was aloof and distant and, un, and, and impersonal like the God of, of, of Islam. No, he's a personal God concerned about these churches. Aware of their condition. Grieving over them. Praying for them. Trying to encourage them. They needed a second touch. And that's what they got through these letters. They also drive home the fact that he was going to be faithful. Faithful to a promise he made before he left this earth. That the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Jesus was saying, I know you're on the defensive. I know you're on the ropes. I know you're being persecuted. But let me tell you, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. At this point, John saw a door open in heaven. And the, he was raptured up. To the throne room of God. What a glorious thing that must have been for a man to be taken up to the throne room of God. And just as he was taken up at this point to the throne room of God, I believe that his snatching up and taking out to the throne room of God is a symbol of the rapture occurring before the tribulation begins, the church being taken out of this world. And John then begins to uh, proceed to describe that throne room in detail. He says that the throne is encircled by a rainbow to symbolize God's faithfulness. He says the throne is a place of blazing light symbolizing uh, uh, God's uh, uh, holiness. Uh, there are 24 elders 24 elders who appear to symbolize the raptured church before the throne of God. And that's not all he noticed. He noticed seven lamps, seven lamps of fire that represent the sevenfold nature of the Holy Spirit. There are four living creatures who represent all of God's creation. And there is a host of angels involved in never-ending worship. All of heaven sings, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God the Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Notice three things are emphasized there. The holiness of God, the power of God, and the eternal nature of God. John is dazzled by this scene that he sees in heaven. And as he is looking around noticing all these things, suddenly his attention focuses upon something very small. His attention focuses upon a scroll that is in the right hand of God. God. And he becomes intensely interested in this scroll because he understands that it is the title deed of planet earth. John knows that the earth was created by uh, God for man. And man was given dominion over it. And man was intended to have dominion over it. But man lost that dominion through the sin that occurred in the Garden of Eden. And so John is anxious to find out about this title deed. He is so anxious. John is told that there is only one person only one in all of heaven who is qualified to open this title deed to the earth. And that is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he turns to see the lion, what does he see? He sees a little lamb, a bloody lamb, 
a bloody lamb that has seven horns and seven eyes representing perfect power and perfect wisdom. And John immediately realizes that the lamb and the lion are symbols of the Lord Jesus Christ who suddenly steps forward, takes the scroll from the hand of God, and when this happens, all of heaven breaks forth in celebration singing. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seals. For you were slain and did purchase for God with your blood from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God. And they will reign upon the earth. What a glorious promise that is. In chapter 6, the tribulation begins. Jesus begins to open the scrolls. And as he opens those seals, the tribulation begins. The tribulation, the seal judgments begin to fall upon the earth, and one after another after another, and the wrath of God begins to fall upon those who have rejected the grace, mercy, and the love of God. Four horses of the apocalypse go forth, the white horse representing the antichrist, the red horse symbolizing war, the black horse representing famine, and the ashen or pale horse representing death itself. These are symbolic of the Antichrist's war to conquer the earth. And in the process, one-fourth of humanity dies. That's equivalent in today's terms to one and a half billion people. Sixty million people died in World War II. In the opening stages of the tribulation, one and a half billion people are going to die as, the, as this war begins that the Antichrist uses to try to take over the world. In chapters 8 and 9, we're told that the war begins to escalate. It appears that if you read chapters 8 and 9, that what happens is that this war launched by the Antichrist to conquer the whole world begins to escalate into a nuclear war. A nuclear war. It says that one-third of the earth is burned up. That one-third of the earth's waters are polluted. It also says that one-third of the light of the heavens, the moons, the stars, the sun is obliterated. And that could very easily be due to the fact that if there's ever an all-out nuclear exchange, there will be so much debris sucked up into the atmosphere that a cloud will form that will circle the whole earth that will cause a nuclear winter. Temperatures will plunge. Areas that have never had a freezing temperature will experience it. And that same cloud will be irradiating everything on earth. The result? The living will envy the dead. We're told that by the end of the tribulation period that people will have sores covering their bodies that will not be uh, able to be healed. It's going to be a terrible period. It's called the Great Tribulation. It's the worst period in the recorded history of mankind. And during that latter period, another one-third of humanity is going to die. That means another 1.5 billion. I sat down one time, calculated that. It was just mind-boggling. It's, the, the book of Revelation is teaching that in the first three and a half years of the tribulation, the first three and a half years, one half of humanity will die. Three billion people in today's terms will die during that terrible period of time. The result of this carnage is that the Antichrist succeeds in conquering the world. He literally conquers all of it. Something Hitler dreamed of, something Stalin dreamed of, something Alexander the Great almost achieved. He will conquer it all. We're told that in Revelation chapter 13. And to him was given authority over every tribe, every people, every tongue, and every nation. And to secure his reign, the Antichrist institutes a system of totalitarian control whereby no one can buy or sell anything without a special mark on his hand or on his head, forcing believers to live in wilderness areas as outlaws. Another aspect of the Antichrist control is going to be this man, the false prophet. He's going to be the leader of a one world church that will be headed up uh, by this man, and all religions will be outlawed except the religion of the one world church. People will be expected to worship the Antichrist as God, but praise God, while these negative things are going on, there's going to be some positive things. While that's going on, 144,000 Jews are going to be sealed by Yeshua, as they're, as they're, uh, by, by, the, uh, by a special angel. They're going to be sealed by the Holy Spirit, in fact, uh, because they will accept Yeshua as their Messiah. They will be sealed for redemption, and they are supernaturally going to be protected by God from all harm during this terrible seven-year period. I called my friend Zola Levitt one time, and I said, Zola, do you truly believe that those 144,000 are going to be literal Jews sealed by God? And he said, well, of course. It says they're Jews. It tells what tribes they come from. I said, well, you know, 85% of all the commentaries on Revelation spiritualize that and say, well, that's really talking about the church. He said, what would God have to do to convince you they're Jews? He says they're Jews. He names them by tribes. He needed to put a neon light in the sky and say Jews. He said, they're Jews. He said, after all, why do you think God has given us the kind of personality he has? Well, I wasn't going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. 
So I played dumb. I said, what do you mean? He said, don't you know any Jews? I said, yes. He said, have you never noticed that we're a little bit pushy? (laughs) I said, well, Zola, now that you mention it, yes, I have noticed. He said, David, we are the world's super salesmen. And in the tribulation, God's going to seal 144,000 of us. And we're going to go forth as the world's super salesman for Jesus Christ. And we're going to convert more people in seven years period of time than you Gentiles have in 2,000 years. And I said, praise the Lord. I hope it's true. The gospel is also going to be proclaimed by two witnesses of God in Jerusalem who will also be supernaturally protected. I think they're most likely going to be Enoch and Elijah. And they are portrayed in the book of Zechariah as two olive trees supplying the oil to light the lamps of truth and enlightenment for the world. And let me tell you something interesting about this. The labors of the two witnesses, the labor of the 144,000 Jews, their works during this time, The impact of the rapture itself and the impact of the tribulation judgments is going to result in a great host of people accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. A great host. So great we're told you cannot even begin to count them. They will come from every tribe, every tongue, every nation. Most will be killed, not all but most. John sees the spirits of these martyrs in heaven under the altar and before the throne and they're worshiping God and they're crying out for vengeance. They are a great multitude, as I say, from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Their salvation emphasizes an important point. If you don't remember anything else today, remember this. The point here is that when God pours out tribulation, when God pours out wrath, His fundamental purpose is never to punish. His fundamental purpose is never to punish. His fundamental purpose is to bring people to repentance so that they might be saved. What a glorious God. Even when he pours out his wrath, the purpose is to bring people to repentance so that they might be saved. Look what it says in Isaiah 26, 9. When the earth experiences your judgments, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. That, my friends, is a God of grace. Now, at the midpoint of the tribulation, something supernatural occurs in the heavens, and that is a war. Satan and his demonic horde try one last time to take the throne of God. And Michael the archangel and the armies of God fight Satan in the heavens and prevent him from doing that. Satan is cast down to earth. He comes down in great wrath. The Bible says, knowing that his time is short, which means Satan knows Bible prophecy. Although most Christians don't, Satan knows it. He will come down knowing his time is short. He is going to possess the Antichrist at that time. And he's going to motivate the Antichrist to kill the two witnesses. To declare himself to be God. And then to desecrate the temple in Jerusalem. And Satan is also going to motivate this man to annihilate the Jews. And guess what? During the last half of the tribulation, the Antichrist possessed by Satan becomes absolutely obsessed with one thing, annihilating every Jew on planet earth. You've got to understand how much Satan hates the Jewish people. He hates them with a passion. He hates them because they've given the, they are the chosen people. He hates them because they've given the world the Bible. He hates them because they gave the world the Messiah. He hates them because God has promised that in the end times, a great and glorious remnant of the Jews will look upon him whom they have pierced, weep and well and mourn as one weeps over the loss of an only son, and accept Yeshua as their Hamashiach. And Satan does not want to see one Jew saved. That's what the Holocaust was all about. Destroy the Jews. We're told in the book of Revelation that during the tribulation there will be a greater Holocaust. Two-thirds of the Jews will die during the last three and a half years of the tribulation. But praise God there's going to be a great remnant that will live to the end. And they will look upon Jesus and they will cry, Baruch haba b'ashim Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they will be saved to the everlasting glory of Almighty God, despite all of the efforts of Satan. What a glorious day that's going to be. Now, as we move into the last half of the tribulation, the final three and a half years, the Antichrist becomes obsessed with his goal of annihilating the Jews. And as he focuses all of his attention upon the annihilation of the Jews, his empire begins to fall apart. All of Asia, I believe, will go into revolt against the Antichrist. And an army of 200 million will march across Asia to overthrow the Antichrist. Meanwhile, God in His grace and mercy decides to give mankind one last opportunity to repent before the final outpouring of His wrath. And He does that despite the fact that the vast majority of all people have refused to repent. And in fact, they have doubled up their fists and they are cursing God instead of repenting. But God is still patient and He's going to give them one more chance. So God sends forth a gospel angel. A gospel angel who communicates to the earth 
the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Proclaiming the gospel to every person on planet earth. Matthew 24 says Jesus will not return until the gospel has been proclaimed to every person. That's going to happen supernaturally at the end of the tribulation. When this angel goes forth and proclaims the gospel to every person on planet earth. The Lord then proceeds to pour out his wrath one last time. In what are called the bold judgments. And in the process the capital city of the Antichrist Mystery Babylon, which I believe with all my heart is going to be Rome, is going to be totally destroyed in one hour of one day. At that point, the Antichrist and himself uh, will, uh, Antichrist and his false prophet will be in the Valley of Armageddon. They will be there with their armies waiting for those armies from Asia to come. And it is at that moment, as the war is about to begin, that the Lord Jesus Christ will break from the heavens in glory and majesty. He will return to this earth and he will speak a supernatural word in all the armies of the Antichrist will be destroyed. He returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All the armies gathered in Armageddon are to be destroyed. No wonder that that valley is going to be filled with blood as deep as a horse's bridle for 200 miles. And then he's going to take the Antichrist and the false prophet and he's going to throw them into the lake of fire which is hell. Jesus then proceeds to have an angel bind Satan and put him into a pit. And Satan is bound there throughout the period of the millennial reign. And next Jesus judges all those who are left alive at the end of the tribulation period. Those who have accepted Him as Lord and Savior are allowed to go into the millennium in the flesh. Those who have rejected Him to the end of the tribulation will be consigned to death and will be put into Hades to wait their final judgment. Then the Lord will establish His worldwide reign. He will reign from Mount Zion in Jerusalem. The redeemed, (coughs) those of us in glorified bodies, we will be scattered all over planet earth to help the Lord Jesus Christ in His reign. Some of you are going to be presidents, some governors, some school board chairmen, some city councilmen, some of you are going to be teachers, judges. We are going, every person in a position of authority on planet earth during the millennium will be a person in a glorified body as Jesus reigns from Jerusalem as King of Kings. David reigns from Jerusalem in His glorified body as the King of Israel. And the world, oh my, the world will be flooded with peace, righteousness, and justice. The light and glory, Shekinah glory of the Lord will go forth from Mount Zion over all the world. And as you see on the left side of this picture, people will take their implements of war and beat beat them into plowshares. All of creation will be redeemed. Nature will be redeemed. The wolf will lie down with the lamb. The lion will eat straw with the ox. A little boy will play with cobras. There will be perfect peace within the kingdom of God between man and his uh, man in nature. But at the end of that thousand years of perfect peace, righteousness, and justice, Satan will be released. And incredibly, he will be able to successfully uh, uh, tempt the majority of those in the flesh to revolt against Jesus Christ. There are people who look at me and they say, that's crazy. How could that be? A thousand years of perfect peace, righteousness, and justice? Why would anybody revolt? Well, think about it for a moment. Think about what it would live like, what it would be like to live in the flesh under the rule of the rod of iron. The rule of the rod of iron. Jesus is going to have a theocratic kingdom. He's going to give the law. There'll be no dickering with the law. There won't be pressure groups. There won't be political parties. Nobody will be able to go in and say, well, would you give me a special this or a special that? And when a person violates the law, they will be arrested immediately. They will be taken before a judge in a glorified body. There will be one a short trial. That person will have the mind of Christ. That person will be convicted. That person will be given their sentence. There will be no appeal whatsoever because the first decision will be perfect because it will be given by a person in a glorified body. Can you imagine what people will be like in the flesh during that time? Can you imagine they'll say, oh, praise you, Jesus, praise you, Jesus, while they're clenching their teeth? Because what they want is a little promiscuous sex on the side and some gambling and they want this and that. All the things that all the things the flesh wants. And so at the end of that thousand years, that perfect reign, Satan will come and say, let's get the joker in Jerusalem. And the vast majority of mankind will respond. And once again, God will prove. Once again, you do not change people by putting them in a perfect environment. You can only change people through the power of the Holy Spirit changing their heart. History goes in a circle. It starts with two people in a perfect environment, and they rebel. It ends up with all of mankind in a perfect rebellion, and the majority of people rebel against God. At the end of that time, Satan and his rebels are defeated, and Satan is cast in the lake of fire to be tormented forever, together with the uh, demonic hordes of his and the Antichrist and the false prophet. And at this point, the redeemed, you and I, are going to be taken up to that new Jerusalem that Jesus has been preparing for our eternal abode. And I think that from that new Jerusalem, We're going to be able to witness two things. First, we're going to witness the great white throne judgment. 
This is a judgment of the damned. This is a judgment of all those who have ever lived, who died outside of faith relationship with God. They will be resurrected. They will be brought before the Jesus, Jesus Christ. And he will judge each of them. And what a judgment it will be. It's a judgment of the damned because all they will have to offer is their works. And no person can be justified by works. And so each of them will be condemned. And each of them will be cast into the lake of fire. The second thing we will witness is that the earth will be consumed with fire. All the pollution of Satan's last revolt will be burned away. And out of that fiery inferno will come a new earth. I love this drawing. A new earth, a glorious earth, a perfected earth is what we're going to be given. And the new Jerusalem containing you and me in our glorified bodies, we're going to be lowered down to the new earth. And God himself will come down to that new earth and he will live in our presence and we will see the face of God. That means that for all eternity we're going to have intimate personal relationship with our creator. I tell you, I I, I cannot begin. Uh, I I grew up in a church that for 30 years taught me I was going to spend eternity floating around on a cloud playing a harp. (laughs) Well, I couldn't get excited about that. I I never looked for the Lord to come. I didn't want to spend eternity floating around a cloud playing a harp, a, a disembodied glob. And then I got to reading the Word of God, and man, I got so excited. I got so, I, it said, hey, no, David, you're going to be given a glorified body. You're going to live on a, on a perfected earth for all eternity. God's going to come down to earth and live in your presence. I, I got so excited. I was jumping the pews, hanging from the chandelier, shouting hallelujah. Uh, my church thought I went Pentecostal overnight, and all I did was discover God's <laughs> prophetic Word. And the sad thing is, They didn't think it was interesting at all. They booted me right over the church steeple. Well, the message of Revelation. You find it in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Even so, amen. The message is repeated at the end, chapter 22, verse 12. The last words of Jesus on this earth. They were on the cross. These were the last words on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. Those words were spoken by Jesus 2,000 years ago on the Isle of Patmos. But keep in mind that to the Lord a thousand years is like a day. And as we await the Lord's return, the book of Revelation tells us there are four things we're to do. Four things. Here we are. Checklist. See if you're doing them. Number one, we are to obey. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. Are you obeying the Lord in your daily walk with him? Are you subjected to him in obedience as the Holy Spirit, really the president and ruler of your life? Number two, it says we are to worship. As you heed the words of this book, worship God. And this is not just talking about celebratory worship. It's talking about all aspects of worship. The greatest worship is what you do when you leave from a celebration of worship. And you go into the world and you take the Lord Jesus Christ with you. And you live for the Lord Jesus Christ in the world. That's the greatest worship. And the third, we are to live yearning. Let the Spirit and the bride say, come. We're the bride. We're the church. We are to be yearning for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to be living with an eternal perspective, looking for the Lord to come any moment. And the fourth thing we're to do, protect. Do not add or take away from the words of this book. We are to protect the integrity of God's Word from those who would twist it for the advancement of their own purposes. To conclude, let me observe that the overall message of Revelation is one of great, great encouragement. The message is that God is on the throne God is in control, and God has the wisdom and the power to orchestrate all the evil of mankind to the triumph of Jesus Christ. Let me summarize it. God is in control, Satan is doomed, Jesus is destined to triumph, and you and I, the redeemed, have the promise that we will rule with Jesus over a world flooded with peace, righteousness, and justice. In other words, my friends, the message of the book of Revelation is we win in the end. Praise the Lord, we're going to win. And that is the reason that every day when I see the sun come up, I cry from the depths of my heart, Maranatha, 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 come quickly, Lord Jesus. Thank you and God bless you. This has been Revelation Wrath, Revelation Glory, presented by Dave Reagan. To receive a free catalog of all of our Bible study DVDs, CDs, audio tapes, and books, Information on upcoming Bible conferences in your area or details of our missionary outreach. Call 800-977-2177 24 hours a day or on the web at compass.org.